Today I want to look into the untold story of the Carnegie Diplodocus. It's uh, arguably the single best known dinosaur skeleton in the world. It's uh, of course the sauropod dinosaur Diplodocus and it's best known from the Carnegie Museum specimen, this mounted skeleton that's known as CM84. Though we'll see later that's not necessarily uh, the best way to refer to it. Uh, and it's known annoyingly as Dippy, which I think is a desperately uh, gross name for such an elegant animal. But it seems to have caught on pretty much globally. Now, it's not known just by that original skeleton, of course, but from its many casts. Uh, this is the one in the Natural History Museum in London, which was there until relatively recently. Uh, and the skeleton originally came about on expeditions that were funded by Andrew Carnegie, the steel magnate from the late 18th century, who wanted it to put in here the museum that he'd also funded. So the excavation and the preparation, the mounting, uh, all came about by his initiative and funding. And moulds were made and casts were made from those moulds and sent to 10 museums around the world. Uh, to very well-known and, and visible museums in London, Berlin, Paris, Vienna, and other places. The intention being on Carnegie's point that he would be able to uh, get the attention of world leaders uh, through doing this, and that's why all these were nominally at least donated not to the museums, but to, for example, the King of England and the uh, Emperor of Germany. And his goal in doing this was to persuade world leaders away from warfare and towards negotiation and, and uh, thereby bring an end to global war. And as you see, this process began in the early 1900s and given what happened in 1914, I guess you could make a judgment about how successful that was. But I don't want to talk about those casts much today because that really is, is a very well-known story. I want to look more about the original skeleton itself, it was mounted in 1907, and here you see it in the Carnegie Museum as it then was. Mounted, you'll notice, two years after the London cast went up. But the composition of the skeleton was extremely complex, and this is why I think just calling it CM84 is a bit misleading. So as you can see, a large part of the skeleton did come from an individual CM84, but plenty of contributions were also made from uh, CM94, a referred specimen, and also contributions of fossil material from three other diplodocid specimens. But that's not all, because a lot of what was needed couldn't be found at all and had to be sculpted. So uh, these specimens were brought into play to provide other parts of the skeleton. And as we'll see in a moment, something was wrong, particularly with these two specimens that contributed the right forelimb and the forefeet. And some parts of the skeleton remain missing completely, but there's nothing to really complain about because these parts, the clavicles, interclavicles, sternal ribs and gastralia, are pretty consistently missing from almost all mounted skeletons of dinosaurs in museums because it's so difficult to know what was there and how it was oriented because of bad preservation. But this gives you an idea of how complex the composition is of that mounted skeleton in the Carnegie Museum. In yellow, we see CM84 itself and the contributions made by other fossils uh, and also casts made from those fossils in some cases can be seen here. And since that skeleton first went up, things got more complicated because changes have been made. The original skull that was mounted, we see here on the left, in a photograph of one of the casts of that skull that was taken in Paris as the Paris mount was being put up in 1907, I think. And that was a composite based on a brain case from one specimen and the rest of the skull taken from another. And it's been replaced at some stage by a cast of this very nice single specimen, CM11161. The bizarre thing is nobody knows when that was done. It was sometime between 1924 and 1971, but that's as far as I and the Carnegie Museum staff have been able to narrow it down based on historical photos and accounts and what we know about what was found when. And this inability to tie down details of what was done and when is really a, a recurring theme as we've worked through trying to get our hands around this specimen that we think of as being so very well documented and well understood. Now, the forefeet I mentioned earlier uh, were problematic. And in the original mount, the casts that were used were taken from AM965, AMNH965, which is not a diplodocid at all, but a camera saurid. Uh, 
And what we have in this photo is the marvellous French Natural History Museum. And the great thing about this, and particularly about its Diplodocus, is that it's never been moved or altered at all since it went up well over 100 years ago. It wasn't even moved during the war to keep it safe. So what we see here is the original cast in the original posture as put up by Carnegie Museum staff, led by Arthur Coggeshall. And you can see that uh, not only are the bones themselves wrong, uh, we have far too many phalanges and ungals, but also the posture that's been given to it here is completely wrong with a splayed out manus that's been known for a very long time to be incorrect. So different museums have dealt with this differently. Uh, what we're looking at here is the Humboldt Museum in Berlin in Germany. And what they've done is, is they retained the original plaster casts that were given to them in 1907, but they've thrown out some of the excess unguals and phalanges and they've reposed the remaining elements in something that's a, a much better approximation to real sauropod forefoot posture. So the metacarpals are still much too long for a diplodocid, but at least they're organised in the right way. But back at the Carnegie Museum itself, uh, way back in 1999, that is way back these days, 24 years ago. They replaced those camera sword forefeet, forefeet with casts taken from a specimen that used to be CM662, uh, the spe species Diplodocus hayi. Now, that specimen itself has had a, a complex history, and it was given to the uh, Cleveland Museum in Ohio, and subsequently traded on from there to the Houston Museum of Nature and Sciences down in Texas, and has subsequently been reassigned from the genus Diplodocus. This species, Hayai, has been put in its own genus, Galliomopus, by Chop et al. So now that specimen is in Houston, and this photograph of its forefoot was taken there. And for some time, it was a cast of this that was on the original Carnegie skeleton, until it was replaced again as part of the major remounting uh, of 2007 and for this they used scaled up casts of a small forefoot that had been referred to Diplodocus carnegie itself from the Wyoming Dinosaur Center but as is so often with these things it now seems likely that these didn't actually belong to Diplodocus at all let alone Diplodocus carnegie and they turn out to be uh, in the phylogenetic analysis of Shop et al they turn out to be some kind of Diplodocid but not Diplodocus so it seems that the Forefoot in the Houston Museum is the best one available, but unfortunately not the one on the cast at the moment. So much going on with the forefeet. Uh, but there were also problems elsewhere in the forelimb. So here we've seen this photo before, or a very similar one, of the 1907 mount. Uh, take a good look there at the humeri, the, the upper arm bones. Here we see them close to each other. You can see there's a terrible mismatch going on here. And even if you allow for some slight foreshortening due to perspective, it's obvious that these bones don't really belong together at all. Now, the one on the left of this photo, which is the right-hand side of the skeleton, uh, compares extremely well with AMNH5855, which is a referred humerus of Diplodocus, uh, whereas the one on the right uh, is very much more closely corresponds to a Camarasaurus supremus humerus in Osborne and Mook's fantastic 1921 monograph. So it seems that uh, Camarasaurid humerus and possibly other elements as well had found their way into that original cast. So what could be done about this? Well, a while back, the Carnegie Museum undertook a whole bunch of uh, queries to try and figure out where they could source alternative forelimbs to put on their Diplodocus. And they tried uh, five or six different institutions, but the one that I am most intrigued by is, was the Denver Museum, uh, which they approached concerning this mounted skeleton. And that attempt to fix their specimen came apart when it became apparent that its forelimbs were actually cast from the original Carnegie mount. So these are copies of the ones that needed to be replaced. So in the end, the Carnegie Museum in its 2007 remount was able to replace those humeri with scaled sculptures taken from a BYU specimen, and that's what's there today. Now, we mentioned that 10 casts were made and sent around the world, and all the real work of the casting was done as early as 1910, with just a few bits and pieces done in 1930 to repair some bits and bobs and replace some missing pieces uh, in order to make the last two donations to Mexico City and to Munich. 
But after that, the moulds lay around in the basements of the Carnegie Museum gathering dust. Well, and actually literally gathering soot. They became extremely sooty uh, and were about to be thrown out as part of a, a big exercise in reducing the amount of material in collections in uh, the early 1950s. But happily, the curator of dinosaurs at the Carnegie Museum at that time was Leroy Pop Kay, who was a native of the Vernal area of Utah. And rather than allowing the moles to be thrown out, he arranged for them to be donated to the Fieldhouse Museum of Natural History in Vernal. Now, this was a tiny museum in a tiny town. So it was quite a coup for them to get hold of these moulds, but also quite an imposition. You, you can see here uh, the moulds quite nicely following the shape, by the way, of the, the fused Sogra Manilia, but taking up a lot of space in that museum, which didn't really have space for anything else. And they felt there was not going to be nearly enough space for them to put up the mounted Diplodica skeleton in there, uh, at least while retaining other exhibits. So what were they going to do with it? Well, the answer is they cast the elements in concrete rather than the usual plaster having done some experiments with different kinds of concrete, different aggregates, to figure out what would be most robust against the extremely variable weather in that part of Utah. It gets very, very hot in summer, very, very cold in winter, and has some very fast winds as well. Now, here we see Ernest Unterman, who is the museum director on the left, and to the right, his wife, Billy Unterman, who was a scientist in her own right and functioned as the staff scientist of the museum. And here, what they're doing is grouting cast cervical vertebrae of their concrete copy. So the casts, each vertebra is actually made up of multiple separate casts, sometimes as many as 30. They needed to be glued together and smoothed over, and that's what they're doing here. So that all worked out really well, that the concrete cast was assembled outdoors. Here you see it early in the mounting process. You can see the metal scaffolding that went in there as well. And here you can see it nearly finished, and I, I like that it's right next to this road with a petrol station on the other side, gas station, I suppose I should say, since it's in America. And the completed cast really became a, a bit of a cultural icon in at least that corner in Utah for three decades. I'd like to read to you some extracts from this article written by Ernest Unterman himself uh, shortly after the skeleton was mounted, titled Dippy Draws Dudes by Thousands boosts tourist travel to museum. And I think you'll find that this article is itself a museum piece in its own way. Without benefit of seductive curves or a come-hither look, remember this is the 1950s, Dippy, the 76-foot-long skeleton of the dinosaur Diplodocus, standing out on the lawn of the Utah Fieldhouse of Natural History, dazzles and delights the tourists known to the trade as dudes. As a motorist pulls up to the curb, father hardly has time to set the brake before, well, of course, obviously dad is driving. He hardly has time to set the brake before the entire family erupts from the car and dashes across the lawn to charge Dippy amid gleeful squeals. Dippy is the most photographed object on US Highway No. 40 between Salt Lake City and Denver. Although he was born only six months ago, he has already been photographed thousands of times and has been the subject of as many as seven different camera fans at one time. Now, I've complained about the name Dippy being used for this Diplodocus and its various casts. If there's one thing that's even worse, it's the name that was actually used in this article, which I corrected for this transcription. They, they called it Doppy by mistake. Doppy there herself. So... By the early 1960s, the Untermans had successfully made and mounted their concrete Diplodocus, and they wondered what to do next with the moulds, and inquiries were made from various countries. There was an inquiry from Italy that came to nothing, and another from Japan also, unfortunately, came to nothing. Obviously, where it ended up with was elsewhere in the United States, and specifically in North Carolina, in the town of Rocky Mount, North Carolina, in their children's museum. So here are those moulds again being loaded onto a truck to be shipped across the country from Vernal to North Carolina. And what happened? Well, it's a sad story that I don't really have time to go into here, although you can read about it in a published paper. Um, various attempts were made to get the work done to make the casts and volunteers were recruited and there were sort of weekly evening sessions of trying to move the project along. But it all really just seemed to fizzle out to nothing. So the, the most recent thing I found is this 1966 newspaper cutting 
where somebody wrote in and said, what happened to the giant concrete dinosaur project at Sunset Park? And the answer given was, there's no positive answer concerning the future of this project. Uh, it's in Harold Minges, who is a director of the Children's Museum. He said, the project was delayed for several years for one reason or another. The moulds now are stored in the old Avalon Airport building on NC 97 East. We expect to resume work on the project in the spring, but they never did. And then I found myself thinking, well, I wonder whether we could go to the old Avalon Airport building all these years later and poke around and find these historically significant moulds. Uh, but the answer is no, we couldn't, because that building itself no longer exists and it was bulldozed some decades ago. So we, we do not know what happened in the end to the historic Carnegie Diplodocus moulds, but my best guess is they were probably destroyed along with the building itself and just uh, bulldozed into a pit. At any rate, we do know that by 1985 they'd been lost. Nobody knew what was going on anymore. Here we see a letter from the director of the Children's Museum explaining to someone from the Utah Fieldhouse that they don't know where the moulds are. And by 1989, after it had been up for a little over 30 years, the concrete cast outside the field house was crumbling, despite maintenance. A nice photo here of it being repainted, which we suspect happened periodically. But as I mentioned before, the, the climate in Vernal is crazy, from minus 40 centigrade to 38 centigrade. So it was coming apart by the 1980s. Uh, and it wasn't really clear what could be done, because there were no more moulds that could be used to cast a new one. And what actually happened in the end is Jim Madsen's organisation Dino Lab, working out of Salt Lake City, managed to put together an agreement with the Field House and with the Carnegie Museum to make fresh moulds from the concrete cast, having first repaired and stabilised the cast. So this work was done uh, pretty efficiently, uh, and new elements were cast in lightweight plastic and were eventually, although the, the mounting itself unfortunately took quite a long time, took another three or four years, but eventually those lightweight cast elements were mounted inside the Fieldhouse Museum. And this time they decided they could fit it in the museum. But as you can see, they had to do that by having its neck hanging out across the, the welcome desk and its tail curled around inside the hall. And there wasn't really room for much else apart from the Diplodocus. But to my mind, that's a good trade-off. If all you can fit in your museum is a Diplodocus, that makes it a good museum. Uh, ten years after that, the field house moved from its old building to a much larger purpose-built place. Uh, and you see it here with this beautiful atrium and that same Diplodocus cast, the lightweight cast, remounted uh, and looking much happier in its new surroundings. And there I am underneath, looking up, probably trying to figure out something about the rib articulations. And other second-generation casts have been made from those moulds. Now, we have records of some of them, but uh, not all the details seem to have survived since that work was done in the 90s. But we know of five copies that were made in the sense of Japan. Uh, there are several locations in Florida, for some reason, that had these things built for them. And one, at the moment, is up in Canada, outside Toronto. So what happened to the concrete cast, uh, having been taken down and been used to make moulds from it? Well, it, it sat around for a while, decaying more, until eventually it was given on a, a long-term permanent loan, I think, to the Prehistoric Museum in Price in Utah, somewhere away from Vernal. And there the concrete casts were re-repaired, having apparently either been damaged by the moulding process or decayed again since then, and were then stored in the collections of that museum for another 10 years, where they sat around being ignored until, uh, I'm really pleased to say, very recently they were put on exhibit in the Price Museum. And this is not a great photo here, but uh, hopefully you can find some better ones online by now. These are the concrete elements that stood outside in Vernal for 32 years, having been repaired and repainted on exhibit in the Prehistoric Museum in Price. And there is the hope that they will find a place and the funding to remount these outside again and once more have a concrete Diplodocus in Utah, this time in Price rather than Vernal. And the very last thing that I want to say about these for now is that elements that were cast from the new moulds have been used in other places as well as to make other complete Carnegie Diplodocuses. And in particular, they're used in this iconic rearing mounted Barosaurus skeleton that's in the rotunda of the American Museum of Natural History. 
because uh, not all of Barosaurus was available, and it was filled in with Carnegie Diplodocus elements, particularly for the anterior cervicals and bits of the limbs. So the result is, if you look at the skeletal reconstruction here, you can see all the parts that are shown in grey are actually Diplodocus rather than Barosaurus. And in particular, they are Carnegie Diplodocus elements that were cast from moulds that were taken from a concrete cast that was made from the moulds that were taken from the original Carnegie Diplodocus. And that is the untold story. If you want more, if you want much, much, much more, I recommend three papers that I've been working on with colleagues. Uh, the one covering the early part of this talk in far more detail, uh, co-written largely with people from the Carnegie Museum, you can see the in-progress manuscripts, maybe 80 or 90% done, at the first link you see here. The second part of the story about the concrete Diplodocus is now published in Geology of the Intermountain West, and that's open access. And the third part, also in process, maybe 70 or 80 percent done. And again, you can read the current version of the manuscript at the link shown here. The untold story is now told. Thank you for listening. I hope you've enjoyed it.